Meanwhile, on a distant part of the plain, the warrior Turnus was chasing a few stragglers. He was less vigorous now, and less and less delighted with the triumphant progress of his horses, when the wind carried to him this sound of shouting and of unexplained terror. He pricked up his ears. It was a confused noise from the city, a murmuring with no hint of joy in it. What is this, he cried in wild dismay, pulling on the reins to stop the chariot. Why such grief and distress on the walls, and all this clamour streaming from every part of the city? His sister, who was driving the chariot in the shape of Matiscus, and had control of the horses and the reins, protested. This way, Turnus, let us go after the Trojans. This is where our first victories showed us the way. There are others whose hands can defend the city. Aeneas is bearing hard on Italians in all the confusion of battle. We too can deal out death without pity to Trojans. You will kill as many as he does, and not fall short in the honours of war. Turnus made his reply. O oh, my sister, I recognised you some time ago, when first you shattered the treaty with your scheming and engaged in this war. And you do not deceive me now pretending not to be a goddess. But whose will is it that you have been sent down from Olympus to endure this agony? Was it all to see the cruel death of your pitiable brother? For what am I to do? What stroke of fortune could grant me safety now? No one is left whom I love as much as I loved Moranus, and I have seen him before my own eyes calling for me as he fell a mighty warrior laid low by a mighty wound. The luckless Ufens has died rather than look on my disgrace, and the Trojans have his body and his arms. Shall I stand by and see our homes destroyed? This is the one indignity that remained. And shall I not lift up my hand to refute the words of Drances? Shall I turn tail? Will this land of Italy see Turnus on the run? Is it so bad a thing to die? Be gracious to me, you gods of the underworld, since the gods above have turned their faces from me. My spirit will come down to you unstained, knowing nothing of such dishonour, and worthy of my great ancestors to the end. Scarcely had he finished speaking, when Sarkes suddenly came galloping up on his foaming horse, having ridden through the middle of the enemy, with an arrow wound full in his face. On he rushed, calling the name of Turnus and imploring him. You are our last hope of safety, Turnus. You must take pity on your people. The sword and spear of Aeneas are like the lightning, and he is threatening to throw down the highest citadels of Italy and give them over to destruction. Firebrands are already flying to the roofs. Every Latin face Every Latin eye is turned to you. The king himself is at a loss. Whom should he choose to marry our daughters? What treaties should he turn to? And then the queen, who placed all her trust in you, has taken her own life. Fear overcame her, and she fled the light of day. Alone in front of the gates, Mesopus and bold Atinas are holding the line. And all round them on every side stand the battalions of the enemy in serried ranks. Their drawn swords are a crop of steel bristling in the fields. And you are out here wheeling your chariot in the deserted grasslands. Turnus was thunderstruck, bewildered by the changing shape of his fortune, and stood there dumb and staring. In that one heart of his there seethed a bitter shame. A grief shot through with madness, love driven on by fury, and a consciousness of his own courage. As soon as the shadows lifted from his mind and light returned, he forced his burning eyes round towards the walls, looking back in deep dismay from his chariot at the great city. There, between the stories of a tower, came a tongue of flame rolling and billowing to the sky. It was taking hold of the tower which he had built himself, 
putting the wheels under it and fitting the long gangways. Sister, he said, the time has come at last. The fates are too strong. You must not delay them any longer. Let us go where God and cruel fortune call me. I am resolved to meet Aeneas in battle. I am resolved to suffer what bitterness there is in death. You will not see me put to shame again. This is madness, but before I die, I beg of you, let me be mad. No sooner had he spoken than he leapt to the ground from his chariot and dashed through all his enemies and their weapons, leaving his sister behind him to grieve as his charge broke through the middle of their ranks. Just as a boulder comes crashing down from the top of a mountain, torn out by gales, washed out by flood water, or loosened by the stealthy passing of the years. It comes down the sheer face with terrific force, an evil mountain of rock, and bounds over the plain, rolling with it woods and flocks and men. So did Turnus crash through the shattered ranks of his enemies towards the walls of the city, where all the ground was wet with shed blood, and the air sang with flying spears. There he made a sign with his hand, and in the same moment he called out in a loud voice, Enough, Rutulians, put up your weapons, and you too, Latins. Whatever fortune brings is mine. It is better that I should be the one man who atones for this treaty than all of you, and settles the matter with the sword. At these words, the armies parted and left a clear space in the middle between them. But when Father Aeneas heard the name of Turnus, he abandoned the walls and the lofty citadel, sweeping aside all delay and breaking off all his works of war. He leapt for joy and clashed his armour with a noise as terrible as thunder. Huge he was as Mount Athos or Mount Eryx, or Father Apenninus himself, roaring when the holm oaks shimmer on his flanks and delighting to raise his snowy head into the winds. Now at last the Rutulians and the Trojans and all the men of Italy, the defenders guarding the high ramparts and the besiegers pounding the base of the walls with their rams, they all turned their eyes eagerly to see and took the armour off their shoulders. King Latinus himself was amazed at the sight of these two huge heroes, born at opposite sides of the earth, coming together to decide the issue by the sword. There, on a piece of open ground on the plain, they threw their spears at long range as they charged, and when they clashed the bronze of their shields rang out and the earth groaned. Blow upon blow they dealt with their swords, as chance and courage met and mingled in confusion. Just as two enemy bulls on the great mountain of Scylla, or on top of Taburnus, bring their horns to bear and charge into battle. The herdsmen stand back in terror, the herd stands silent and afraid, and the heifers low quietly together, waiting to see who is to rule the grove who is to be the leader of the whole herd. Meanwhile, the bulls are locked together, exchanging blow upon blow, gouging horn into hide, till their necks and shoulders are awash with blood, and all the grove rings with their lowing and groaning. Just so did Aeneas of Troy and Turnus, son of Dornus, rush together with shields clashing, and the din filled the heavens. Then Jupiter himself lifted up a pair of scales with the tongue centred and put the lives of the two men in them to decide who would be condemned in the ordeal of battle and with whose weight death would descend. Turnus leapt forward, thinking he was safe, and lifting his sword and rising to his full height, he struck with all his strength behind it. The Trojans shouted and the Latins cried out in their anxiety while both armies watched intently. But in the height of his passion, the treacherous sword broke in mid-blow and left him defenceless, had he not sought help in flight. Faster than the east wind he flew, when he saw his own right hand holding nothing but a sword handle he did not recognise. 
The story goes that when his horses were yoked, and he was mounting his chariot in headlong haste to begin the battle, he left his father's sword behind, and caught up the sword of his charioteer Metiscus. For some time, while the Trojans were scattered and in flight, that was enough. But when it met the divine armour made by Vulcan, the mortal blade was brittle as an icicle, and shattered on impact, leaving its fragments glittering on the golden sand. At this, Turnus fled in despair, and tried to escape to another part of the plain, weaving his uncertain course, now to this side, now to that, for the Trojans formed a dense barrier round him, hemming him in between a huge marsh and the high walls. Nor did Aeneas let up in his pursuit. Slowed down as he was by the arrow wound, his legs failing him sometimes, and unable to run. He still was ablaze with fury, and kept hard on the heels of the terrified Turnus. Like a hunting dog that happens to trap a stag in the bend of a river, or in a ring of red feathers used as a scare, pressing him hard with his running and barking. The stag is terrified by the ambush he is caught in, or by the high river bank. He runs, and runs back a thousand ways, but the untiring Umbrian hound stays with him, with jaws gaping. Now he has him, now he seems to have him, and the jaws snap shut, but he is thwarted and bites the empty air. Then, as the shouting rises louder than ever, all the river banks and pools return the sound, and the whole sky thunders with the din. As he ran, Turnus kept shouting at the Rutulians, calling each of them by name and demanding the sword he knew so well. Aeneas, on the other hand, was threatening instant death and destruction to anyone who came near. Much as that alarmed them, he terrified them even more by threatening to raise their city to the ground, and though he was wounded, he did not slacken in his pursuit. Five times round they ran in one direction, five times they rewound the circle for this was no small prize they were trying to win at games. What they were competing for was the lifeblood of Turnus. It so chanced that a bitter-leaved wild olive tree had stood on this spot, sacred to Faunus and long revered by sailors. On it, men saved from storms at sea used to nail their offerings to the Laurentine god and dedicate the clothes they had vowed for their safety. But the Trojans, making no exception for the sacred tree trunk, had removed it to clear space for the combat. In this stump, the spear of Aeneas was now embedded. The force of his throw had carried it here and lodged it fast in the tough wood of the root. He strained at it and tried to pull it out so that he could hunt with a missile the quarry he could not catch on foot. Wild now with fear, Turnus cried, Pity me, I beg of you, Faunus, and you, good Mother Earth, hold on to that spear. If I have always paid you those honours which Aeneas and his men have profaned in war. So he prayed, and he did not call for the help of the god in vain. Aeneas was long delayed, struggling with the stubborn stump, and no strength of his could prize open the bite of the wood. While he was heaving and straining with all his might, the goddess Juturna, daughter of Dornus, changed once more into the shape of the charioteer Metiscus and ran forward to give Turnus his sword. Venus was indignant that the nymph was allowed to be so bold, so she came and wrenched out Aeneas's spear from deep in the root. Then these glorious warriors, their weapons and their spirits restored to them, one relying on his sword, the other towering and formidable behind his spear, stood there breathing hard, ready to engage in the contest of war. Meanwhile, the king of all-powerful Olympus saw Juno watching the battle from a golden cloud and spoke these words to her. O oh, my dear wife, what will be the end of this? What is there left for you to do? You yourself know, and admit that you know, that Aeneas is a god of this land, and that he has a right to heaven and is fated to be raised to the stars. What are you scheming? What do you hope to achieve by perching there in those chilly clouds? 
Was it right that a god should suffer violence and be wounded by the hand of a mortal? Was it right that Turnus should be given back the sword that was taken from him? For what could Juturna have done without your help? Why have you put strength into the arm of the defeated? The time has come at last for you to cease and give way to our entreaties. Do not let this great sorrow gnaw at your heart in silence, and do not make me listen to grief and resentment forever streaming from your sweet lips. The end has come. You have been able to harry the Trojans by sea and by land, to light the fires of an unholy war, to soil a house with sorrow and mix the sound of mourning with the marriage song. I forbid you to go further. These were the words of Jupiter. With bowed head, the goddess Juno, daughter of Saturn, made this reply. Because I have known your will, great Jupiter, against my own wishes, I have abandoned Turnus and abandoned the earth. But for your will, you would not be seeing me sitting alone in mid-air on a cloud, suffering whatever is sent me to suffer. I would be clothed in fire, standing close in to the line of battle and dragging Trojans into bloody combat. It was I, I admit it, who persuaded Juturna to come to the help of her unfortunate brother, and with my blessing to show greater daring for the sake of his life, but not to shoot arrows, not to stretch the bow. I swear it by the implacable fountainhead of the river Styx, the one oath which binds the gods of heaven. And now I, Juno, yield and quit these battles which I so detest. But I entreat you for the sake of Latium and the honour of your own kin to allow what the law of fate does not forbid. When at last their marriages are blessed, I offer no obstruction. When at last they come together in peace and make their laws and treaties together, do not command the Latins to change their ancient name in their own land, to become Trojans and be called Teucrians. They are men. Do not make them change their voice or native dress. Let there be Latium. Let the Alban kings live on from generation to generation, and the stock of Rome be made mighty by the manly courage of Italy. Troy has fallen. Let it lie, Troy and the name of Troy. He who devised mankind and all the world smiled and replied, You are the true sister of Jupiter and the second child of Saturn. Such waves of anger do you set rolling from deep in your heart. But come now, lay aside this fury that arose in vain. I grant what you wish, I yield, I relent of my own free will. The people of Ausonia will keep the tongue of their fathers and their ancient ways. As their name is, so shall it remain. The Trojans will join them in body only, and will then be submerged. Ritual I will give, and the modes of worship, and I will make them all Latins, speaking one tongue. You will see that the people who arise from this admixture of Ausonian blood will be above all men, above the gods, in devotion, and no other race will be their equals in paying you honour. Juno nodded in assent. She rejoiced and forced her mind to change, leaving the cloud behind her and withdrawing from the sky. This done, the father of the gods pondered another task in his mind and prepared to dismiss Juturna from her brother's side. There are two monsters named Dirai, born to the goddess of the dead of night in one and the same litter with Megaira of Tartarus. The heads of all three she bound with coiling snakes and gave them wings to ride the wind. These attend the throne of savage Jupiter in his royal palace and sharpen the fears of suffering mortals whenever the king of the gods sets plagues or hideous deaths in motion or terrifies guilty cities by the visitation of war. One of these Jupiter sent swiftly down from the heights of heaven with orders to confront Juturna as an omen. She flew to earth carried in a swift whirlwind like an arrow going through a cloud, spun from the bowstring of a Parthian who has armed the barb with a virulent poison for which there is no cure. A Parthian, 
or a Cretan from Sidonia. And it whirs as it flies unseen through the swift darkness. So flew the daughter of night, making for the earth. When she saw the Trojan battle lines and the army of Turnus, she took in an instant the shape of the little bird which perches on tombs and the gables of empty houses and sings late its ill-omened song among the shades of night. In this guise the monster flew again and again at Turnus's face, screeching and beating his shield with her wings. A strange numbness came over him, and his bones melted with fear. His hair stood on end and the voice stuck in his throat. His sister Juturna recognised the Dira from a long way off by the whirring of her wings and grieved. She loosened and tore her hair. She scratched her face and beat her breast, crying, What can your sister do to help you now, Turnus? Much have I endured, but nothing now remains for me, and I have no art that could prolong your life. How can I set myself against such a portent? At last, at last, I leave the battle. Do not frighten me, you birds of evil omen. I am already afraid. I know the beating of your wings and the sound of death. I do not fail to understand the proud commands of great-hearted Jupiter. Is this his reward for my lost virginity? For what purpose has he granted me eternal life? Why has he deprived me of the state of death? But for that, I could at least have put an end to my suffering and borne my poor brother company through the shades. So this is immortality. Will anything that is mine be sweet to me without you, my brother? Is there no abyss that can open deep enough to take a goddess down to the deepest of the shades? At these words, covering her head in a blue-green veil and moaning bitterly, the goddess plunged into the depths of her own river. Aeneas kept pressing his pursuit with his huge spear flashing as long as a tree, and these were the words he spoke in his anger. What is the delay now? Why are you still shirking, Turnus? This is not a race. It is a fight with dangerous weapons at close quarters. Turn yourself into any shape you, you like. Scrape together all your resources of spirit and skill. Pray to sprout wings and fly to the stars of heaven, or shut yourself up and hide in a hole in the ground. Turnus replied, shaking his head. You are fierce, Aeneas. But wild words do not frighten me. It is the gods that cause me to fear, the gods and the enmity of Jupiter. He said no more, but looked round and saw a huge rock, a huge and ancient rock, which happened to be lying on the plain, a boundary stone put there to settle a dispute about land. Twelve picked men, like those the earth now produces, could scarcely lift it up onto their shoulders, but he caught it up in his trembling hands, and, rising to his full height and running at speed, he hurled it at his enemy. But he had no sense of running or going, or lifting, of lifting or moving the huge rock. His knees gave way, his blood chilled and froze, and the stone rolled away under its own impetus, over the open ground between them. But it did not go the whole way, and it did not strike its target. Just as when we are asleep, when in the weariness of night, rest lies heavy on our eyes, we dream we are trying desperately to run further, and not succeeding, till we fall exhausted in the middle of our efforts. The tongue is useless, the strength we know we have fails our body. We have no voice, no words to obey our will. So it was with Turnus. Wherever his courage sought away, the dread goddess barred his progress. During these moments, the thoughts whirled in his brain. He gazed at the Rutulians and the city. He faltered with fear. He began to tremble at the death that was upon him. He could see nowhere to run, no way to come at his enemy, no chariot anywhere, no sister to drive it. As he faltered, the deadly spear of Aeneas flashed. His eyes had picked the spot, and he threw from long range with all his weight behind the throw. Stones hurled by siege artillery never roar like this. 
the crash of the bursting thunderbolt is not so loud. Like a dark whirlwind it flew, carrying death and destruction with it, piercing the outer rings of the sevenfold shield, and laying open the lower rim of the breastplate, it went whistling through the middle of the thigh. When the blow struck, down went great Turnus, bending his knee to the ground. The Rutulians rose with a groan which echoed round the whole mountain, and far and wide the high forests sent back the sound of their voices. He lowered his eyes and stretched out his right hand to beg as a suppliant. I have brought this upon myself, he said, and for myself I ask nothing. Make use of what fortune has given you. But if any thought of my unhappy father can touch you, I beg of you, and you too had such a father in Anchises, take pity on the old age of Dornus, and give me back to my people, or, if you prefer it, give them back my dead body. You have defeated me, and the men of Alsonia have seen me defeated and stretching out my hands to you. Lavinia is yours. Do not carry your hatred any further. There stood Aeneas, deadly in his armour, rolling his eyes, but he checked his hand, hesitating more and more as the words of Turnus began to move him, when suddenly his eyes caught the fatal baldric of the boy Pallas high on Turnus's shoulder with the glittering studs he knew so well. Turnus had defeated and wounded him and then killed him, and now he was wearing his belt on his shoulder as a battle honour taken from an enemy. And he has feasted his eyes on the sight of this spoil, this reminder of his own wild grief. Then, burning with mad passion and terrible in his wrath, he cried, Are you to escape me now, wearing the spoils stripped from the body of those I loved? By this wound which I now give, it is Pallas who makes sacrifice of you. It is Pallas who exacts the penalty in your guilty blood. Blazing with rage, he plunged the steel full into his enemy's breast. The limbs of Turnus were dissolved in cold, and his life left him with a groan, fleeing in anger down to the shades. <laughs>